Here, David, said my lovely wife, Ella, handing me a glass of red wine. Please take your seat. We have an important topic to discuss. Why the wine? I inquired, feeling perplexed. Isn't it too early for that? Just take it, she insisted, pressing the glass into my hand. You might need it. This did not sound very promising, but I agreed. I took a sip and sat down, focusing my attention on her. Watching her is always a pleasure. She's a striking five-foot-four brunette, 29 years old, with a little more than a third of those years spent as my partner and slightly less as my wife. What's happening? I inquired as she sat in silence across the table from me. Her face was shadowed with concern. Her usually bright brown eyes appeared unusually dim. It is difficult. David, I'm not sure where to begin. Ella sighed. Why not start from the beginning? I suggested, bracing myself for bad news. I hoped it was something minor, like a fender bender, and not something serious, like a medical problem. I'm not sure when it started. She sighed again, more deeply, giving me no more hints but implying it wasn't a simple mishap. Are you not sick, honey? I tried to prompt her gently. If so, we can work through it together. Ella mumbled, no, I am not ill. That's a relief, I said, allowing myself to sigh. But I'm not doing so well either, David, she clarified, further confusing me with her ambiguous words. It's complicated. I stayed silent, waiting for her to tell me more. Have you noticed that I've been a little off lately? Not really, Ella. Yes, I have been. David, I'm surprised you didn't notice. Surprised? You have not said anything. I understand you've been irritable, but I assumed it was due to stress. I admitted. It's been going on for several months, David. She shot back, irritated rather than angry. I have been on edge for a long time. I apologize, sweetheart. I hadn't realized. It's not your fault, David, she said her irritation melting into a sympathetic expression. You have not done anything wrong. So, Ella, what's the matter? It's me, honey, she whispered almost silently. I believe we need to separate for a while. I've never been a fighter and have never taken a hard punch in the stomach. But in that moment, I felt as if I knew exactly what it was like. I looked at her, probably with my mouth open in shock. Nothing is permanent. David, Ella hurried to reassure me, only a few months, six at most. Her words provided little comfort, but why? I croaked, my mouth feeling dry and uncomfortable. Because you would not prefer the other option, honey. Ella said this while staring at me. Tears welled in her eyes. This is my problem, and I have to solve it myself. I want to make your pain as minimal as possible, and you think that separating will not hurt me? I demanded, my voice rising for the first time as I stood abruptly, sympathy giving way to anger. I apologize, David. Ella sobbed. Tears are now streaking down her cheeks. I am not handling this well. I simply cannot do this. Before I could respond, she bolted from the room, clattering her chair to the floor. Her sobs are calling as she rushes to her bedroom. What the hell was going on there? I wish I could say I did something sensible and took control, but I did not. Instead, I slumped back in my chair, sighing and burying my head in my hands, attempting to make sense of the previous ten minutes. I already knew these ten minutes would have a negative impact on my life. An hour later, still mired in misery, I noticed Ella standing beside me. She hadn't said anything, and I hadn't heard her leave the bedroom or descend the stairs. I motioned for her to sit down again, not trusting my voice. I'm not sure if I can speak clearly. I apologize, David she said. I should have said nothing. I should have just... Just what? I interrupted, my voice quiet but filled with rage and frustration. Who was he? How long has it been going on? I swear to you, there is no one else, David. You're the only person I love. Can't you see why this is so difficult? I don't see anything, Ella, I yelled. You are killing me here. What the hell is going on? It's me. She sighed heavily. Obviously, I responded. What is wrong with you? It is difficult. She repeated it again, escalating my anger. Help me, Ella. If you say that again, I'm going to lose it, I yelled, truly losing my cool. Tell me what's going on or I'll throw you out of the house. Okay? Ella whimpered, recoiling from my outburst. Something she had not seen before. It's me. Something within me is eating away at me. It's been building for more than a year. Go on, I urged, trying to keep my temper under control. I'll be 30 years old on my next birthday. David. So am I, I reminded her. 
I understand, but it's different for men. You are more handsome than ever. The majority of men are. For a woman, however, things only get worse from here. Saggy breasts and cellulite. But no more miniskirts or tight jeans. Leave a few buttons undone and no one will notice. That is nonsense, I snapped. She had to know she was talking nonsense. Ella looked even more stunning at 29 than she did five years ago. She still looked amazing in her mini skirts, even the super short ones that made me wonder at her audacity to claim that no one noticed her cleavage when she flaunted it, which was like saying no one noticed a bright red Ferrari speeding by. I told her so, and she didn't argue, even giving me a nervous smile as I described how beautiful she was. I mentioned how often I saw men admiring her, and how my friends made lustful remarks about her long, shapely legs when they thought I wasn't paying attention. I described how, just last weekend, I saw an older man maneuver himself for a better view down her top, and how three teenage boys trailed after her tongue, which was practically hanging out, when they noticed her walking topless on the beach during her vacation three months earlier. I know she said, smiling, guilty. I know I still have it. I know men look and stare at me. Men have been trying to look up and down my skirt and top. Some of your friends are lusting after me. I'm constantly fending off wandering hands at parties, and I always say no to guys who ask me out at work. So, what's the problem, Ella? I inquired, choosing to disregard some of the revelations that made me uncomfortable. I do not want to. What? I do not want to. David, she repeated. Sometimes I don't want to reject other men's wandering hands. I want the freedom to accept a date when an attractive man approaches me, to be free, and to return to his place at the end. Why now? What has changed? I inquired unhappily, surprised by what I was hearing. Nothing has changed, honey. It's just that I'm getting older. Right now I feel like I can have any man I want by simply flashing a blank or giving him the eye. But how long will this last? David? How many men will pursue me in the next five years or so? She was talking nonsense again. Of course, Ella would continue to attract the attention of men for many years. After all, her mother was in her late fifties and still drew men like flies to honey. But I did not contradict her. I sat there trying to find the right words and avoiding eye contact. I didn't want to lose her, but her declaration that she wanted the freedom to date other guys had left me stunned. If she was so determined... Perhaps it wasn't worth attempting to stop her, but deep down, I knew I didn't truly feel that way. I'd regret giving up without a fight for the rest of my life. So you want us to break up so you can sleep with other men? Is this it? No, David, that is not it at all, she retorted, her voice filled with rage. I don't want to split up. I adore you and hope to spend my entire life with you. I simply need a short break from our marriage to get this out of my system and sleep with other men. I repeated, feeling down. No, David, she said more calmly this time. I will not insult your intelligence by implying that it will eventually include that. I will not deny that the prospect of ending up in another man's bed is appealing, but it's not only that. Other than a couple of pathetic boys at school, you are the only man I have dated, the only man I've known. This has to do with me being your first, right? I asked. I remembered Ella being dowdy and inexperienced when we first met. We had been paired together at a tennis club social night, and she was genuinely surprised when I asked her out for a drink afterwards. Perhaps you're not as surprised as I was to ask. I quickly fell under the spell of a girl I had barely noticed in the previous year. She was shy and nervous the first time I kissed her, and even more so when I touched her breasts. The first time we went all the way, she laughed and cried, amazed at how wonderful it was and eager to know when we could do it again. I recall taking her shopping for the first time and her reluctance to try on short skirts, as well as her embarrassment when she finally did. I had persuaded her of the difference between the shy young woman and the confident, beautiful, and sophisticated woman I married. Yes, of course it is, Ella responded to my question. That is part of it. You've never been with another man after me, Ella? I asked. I'm fairly certain I know the answer, but I'm concerned about the possibility of a hidden liaison. Of course I have not. And you, David? Ella snapped back, her eyes filled with rage. You know I have not. You're the only one, for goodness sake. Can't you understand? Is that what this is about? Have you actually been listening to me? Can't you see how afraid I am of growing old without ever knowing what it's like to be young, attractive, 
and free. I missed out when other girls my age went exploring. I've never had the opportunity to walk into a pub or club and wonder which guys I'll meet. I've never enjoyed the thrill of deciding how far to let things go, whether to let them take liberties with me, take me outside, or return to their home. I missed out on it all, and I want to experience it now before it's too late. Or I'll go insane. And it's my fault. Of course not, Dave. I never claimed it was. Her voice softened. If I thought it was true, I might have done it behind your back. And Lord knows I've had enough opportunities. But I cannot do that to you. It would kill me to cheat on you. I would rather die. Silence. We sat there for a long, painfully awkward silence, struggling to find words. The silence was only broken by our deep sighs, each of us unsure how to resolve the problem that faced us. Eventually, I tried to demonstrate how unreasonable her attitude was while she repeated what she had been trying to say. We both failed, and I believe we had stopped truly listening to each other by then. Ella prepared some dinner, which we ate in relative silence. Our attempts at conversation devolved into a sort of quiet truce. We discussed signing up for the tennis club's annual tournament. We both continued to play there, but our words trailed off as we realized the futility of not knowing whether we'd still be together. Of course, we went to bed together and cuddled up. Ella tried to fondle me to gauge my interest, but I gently took her hand away. Not out of rage, but because it seemed inappropriate. She did not try again. I eventually fell asleep, knowing that the situation was far from resolved and did not look promising. I understood what Ella wanted and how clean she needed, but I knew I couldn't pass it up. The following morning felt surprisingly normal, albeit quieter than usual. We went through the motions, saying only what was required to keep our routine running smoothly, but engaging little else. Ella seemed to be about to say something meaningful to me. But the moment passed, unspoken. After breakfast, we parted ways. She went to her job while I went to mine. I wasn't worried she'd do something rash that day. The thought did not even occur to me. My worries were about the coming days, weeks, and months. If she couldn't get this idea out of her pretty little head, we wouldn't just have a temporary separation. It would be permanent. I understood the stark reality, but she appeared unwilling or unable to accept it. I returned home from work, surprised to find Ella's car already in the driveway. She usually got home at least a half hour after me. Hello, David. She greeted me from the kitchen where she had begun preparing dinner. Fortunately, she did not offer me another glass of wine. Whatever happened to the one from last night? I apologize, honey, she said. I nodded tersely, deviating from my usual friendly greeting. Look, David, I'm sorry, she said, sensing my coldness. I couldn't concentrate at work today, so I came home early. What? There are no charming suitors at work today, Ella, I replied spitefully. That is not fair, David, she said, her voice tinged with sorrow. I understand that what I'm doing to you is not fair. I realize I'm being a bitch and unreasonable. But I beg you, David, if you won't help me, our marriage is over. Perhaps that is what I want, I shot back. It wasn't true, but I wanted to hurt her out of frustration. But I couldn't bring myself to physically do so. Ella dropped the knife she was using to chop vegetables and collapsed on the kitchen counter, crying. I am a sucker for tears, and which man isn't? I stared at her sobs and told myself she deserved it. Maybe she did, but I loved her too much to see her that way. I stepped over to her and gently squeezed her shoulder. We will figure it out. I spoke softly. Shall we, David? She asked through sobs. But we actually work it out. Ella, when you help me, I will try, I said gently. I don't know how, but I promise to try. That evening produced no concrete resolutions, but it did result in a significant step. I persuaded her to see a marriage counselor. We didn't know one, but it was a start. Ella initially resisted the idea, but eventually agreed, and I breathed a sigh of relief, not only for the prospect of professional assistance, but also for the temporary reprieve it provided. It turned out to be a waste of time because the two counselors we found were overbooked and couldn't schedule us for at least a month. We could not provide a court order or a doctor's note, and we had no desire to do so. So our lives continued. Mostly miserable, but with some brighter moments, especially when we were with others. During such times, life appeared almost normal. 
that is, until the local party we attended nearly demolished everything. The group consisted of about 20 friends, mostly couples, and a few acquaintances we did not know. It started off normally enough with plenty of alcohol, tasty snacks, casual dancing, and lively conversation. The men talked about football while the women had their own conversations. A few hours into the evening, my curiosity got the best of me. Leaning against a doorframe, I overheard a group of women conversing just inside. Maybe I picked the wrong moment. Have you seen the guy? Patrick! Sophia Robinson, a woman who lives just down the street, squeaked. Jacob and Carol brought him along. What a hunk. He's Carol's cousin, apparently. I added another woman whose voice I didn't recognize. He's gorgeous. I wouldn't mind checking out his package. Big feet, big hands. I wonder what else is big. Lily. Caleb has a wife. The group burst into laughter. I was wondering what Caleb would think of such remarks when I recognized another familiar voice. Alice said, he's big. As soon as David left, he pulled me up to dance and drew me close. I mean, very close. Is that close? Someone asked, but I didn't care who. How did it feel? Ella. Huge. My wife giggled. The cheeky devil kept poking it into my stomach. I bet you didn't push him away. You have to take it where you can get it. Ella laughed. Oh, poor you. Lightly teased, the group burst out laughing again. Yes, poor Ella. I growled angrily, barely holding back my rage as I stepped through the door to confront them. The women looked up, surprised, and then burst out laughing again. I was completely unaware of the turmoil Ella and I were going through. Ella's comments appeared to them to be harmless party banter, but for me it felt like a dagger to the heart. All of the women burst out laughing except Ella, who stood there frozen in shock. The color drained from her face as she stared at me, clearly wishing the floor would swallow her. Oh, David, come on, Lily corrected me, noticing my lack of amusement. Ella was simply joking around. You know she wouldn't do anything to hurt you, right? I let out a growl. I'm not so sure anymore. The other women fell silent, exchanging confused looks with Ella and me. Lily opened her mouth, intending to offer more commentary, but then decided to remain silent. I'm getting tired, I snapped at Ella. I'm ready to go whenever you are, unless you prefer to stay and spend more time with Loverboy. Ella recoiled. Her friends gasped as I turned on my heel, leaving them behind. I silently cursed both her words and myself for overreacting. I had heard her and other women say similar things before and laughed them off. This time, though, things were different. The rules had changed. The dynamics had shifted. Our relationship had fractured. Ella dashed after me, pulling me into an empty corridor. She quickly apologized and scolded me in the same breath. I apologize, David, she said, gripping my arms. But there was no reason for the outburst. How will we explain this away? He didn't actually do that. You are already aware of this. She snapped back, her rage boiling over. I can't help but notice he gets a hard-on when he dances with me. This happens all the time. Don't tell me you haven't done the same for some of the girls here tonight. Maybe, I admitted reluctantly, but I did not grab their asses and rub them. I exaggerated. Ella softened her tone. All right. He tried to take some liberties. I warned him. It was just girls talking. Why are you reacting like this? Why do you think I'm reacting like this? I asked, suddenly calm. My question cuts through the tension. Oh, that is it. Just... Oh, David, I think we should go home, Ella exclaimed, suddenly sounding defeated. This is not working. Why don't you stay here, Ella, I snapped. You appear to be having a good time. I was. Maybe next time I'll come alone and really enjoy myself, she retorted, but she moved towards the front door anyway, grabbing her coat as she walked out, followed by me a few steps behind. So, did that go well? For the next few days, it felt like walking on hot coals. We moved around each other, attempting to be polite, or better yet, having nothing to do with one another. It couldn't go on like this forever, and it seemed as if everything was about to explode. It turned out to be more of an implosion. We can't continue like this, David. Ella spoke calmly one morning. You started it, I pointed out. Will you drop this ridiculous idea? If I did, and I promise to. She sighed resignedly. Do you believe me? Why not? Think about it, honey, she responded. If I'm coming home from work, going out with the girls for the evening, dancing closely with a guy at a party like the other night, or attending one of my company's seminars for a week, what would be your thoughts? 
Do you really trust me now? David? Good question, I replied, sighing deeply. I do not know. It would be difficult, so perhaps not. I am no longer sure if I can trust myself. David. Then there's nothing left to say. Then our marriage is over, right, David? That sounds like it. Oddly, with the future, or lack thereof, of our marriage out in the open, we were able to get along better. Not completely understood, but better. We chatted, laughed, and cuddled a few times. We were still sleeping in the same bed. It appeared churlish not to, but I kept to my side, as did Ella. We awoke one morning with my arms around her, spooning, but we quickly pulled away, distancing ourselves. The problem was that I didn't want to pull away. She was stunning, and I still loved her. It was breaking my heart. I would not accept the separation agreement she had requested, but I despised the thought of losing her. Then something happened. I was ambushed when I returned home from work the next day. David, one of the men at work, has invited me out to dinner. Ella spoke. I don't know what to tell them. Would you like to go? I asked, trying to hide my disappointment. Yes, David, she whispered. Sort of, but I do not want to upset you. Wouldn't it bother you if I went on a date with one of the women in my office, I asked. How about the pretty girl from accounts? I had no real or immediate intention of doing so, regardless of how attractive she appeared in the tight jeans she frequently wore. I wasn't sure if Ella would remember Mila from our previous Christmas party. I set out to strike back at her, hoping for a reaction, but it wasn't what I expected. What? She screamed, her eyes brimming with anger. What have you been doing behind my back, you cheating bastard? She stopped covering her mouth with her hand in shock, leaving me stunned, my mouth open but unable to say what came next. What I meant was that Ella broke the long silence but couldn't finish the sentence. What did you mean? Nothing, she sobbed. I didn't mean anything, Ella, I called out, reaching for her, but she pushed me away and sobbed openly. She said she needed to get some fresh air and grabbed her coat, fleeing through the front door and onto the street. Without hesitation, I leaped up and dashed after her. My woman was in pain. I couldn't let her run away like that. Thirty feet down the road, I caught up to Ella and instinctively took her hand in mine. She made a half-hearted attempt to shake me off, but when I held on, she finally gave in, responding to my gentle squeeze with one of her own. We walked silently for about a half mile, with Ella occasionally casting nervous glances at me. What will we do, David? she asked at long last. I love you and do not want to lose you, but... But what, honey? You know what, David? Some days are fine, and I believe I've moved past it. But on other days, something happens that causes me to scream with frustration. Simple things like seeing a cute guy walk by, one of the men at work stopping to ask me a question, or even receiving a phone call from one of my male clients. You must hate me. I could never hate you, Ella, I reassured her. You shocked me the first time you issued your ultimatum. But I can't stop loving you. Ella replied that it was not meant to be an ultimatum. Something clicked in my brain. I remembered something she said that first evening. It was a long shot, but it might be worth a try. Ella, I started cautiously. That first night, you mentioned another option, one that I did not like, but you never told me what it was. You will not like it. Try me. Ella took a few deep breaths before speaking. I meant that I could see other men discreetly so no one we knew would find out. Not many. Maybe one is enough, but probably not. When she hesitated, I quietly spoke up. No, she agreed, unable to meet my gaze. I would not do it in your face. I will not embarrass or humiliate you in any way. Nobody we know, of course. And it wouldn't be often, just the freedom to go out on my own on occasion and let some strange guy chat me up and tell you all about it, or to keep it a secret as long as I had your permission. If you wanted to remain silent, you could. Her voice became more animated as she spoke perhaps hoping that my silence and the absence of objections would sway me. But she was going to be disappointed. I couldn't do it, Ella, I explained solemnly. It is not me. I don't have it in me to stand by and let my wife act like that. I know, she admitted, her excitement fading. I did say you weren't going for it. Why didn't you just cheat on me and get it out of your system without my knowledge? For goodness sake, Ella, why did you have to be so honest? I couldn't do it, David, not behind your back. Ella mumbled quietly. I couldn't cheat on you. You could try. I cried out in desperation, not thinking about what I was saying. I tried. 
she confessed, shocking me. Is that Carol's cousin at the party? I don't even remember his name. I apologize, but I lied to you, David. He felt my bottom while I didn't, discouraging. He asked me to join him in the garden, and I agreed because I was so hot for him. I thought I could do it and get away with it without your knowledge. Anyway, he led me around the side of their garage, pushed me up against the wall, kissed me roughly, and squeezed my breast tightly. I was hot, sweaty, and desperate for it. It was everything I hoped for, and then what? I demanded, my fists clenched tightly, suffocating me. And I could not do it, David. Ella continued abruptly almost. In fact, I couldn't keep cheating on you behind your back and told him to stop. He didn't, and when he tried to pull up my skirt, I slapped his face. He began to pull my top down, so I kneaded him between my legs, and he released me and staggered back. I ran away, and he called me a prick, but he didn't follow me. I growled, I will kill the bastard. No, you will not, David, and it would be unfair. I let him on. I hoped it would help solve our problems in some way. I was kidding myself. It would not have resolved anything, just made matters worse. I cleaned myself up and went back inside. And damn it, if the girls I hung out with didn't start talking about him like fools, I said. I spoke, and you heard it. I felt proud of myself for pushing him off. But then you started shouting at me, which didn't seem fair. That sounds stupid. Now, doesn't it? I wasn't thinking clearly. Christ, I muttered. The stories she just told me have left me speechless. So, David, you can see that I couldn't do it. I can't do it. I can't cheat on you any more than you are willing to. Let me do it. There is only one way, despite the risks. As I suggested, even if our marriage ends, I refuse to believe it. We will find a way. We'll get together again. And if not, we will. David, we need to. That about concluded the conversation, with neither of us having anything else to say. My wife was planning to go away for a while, sleep with a bunch of guys and then come back and our marriage will be fine again. My wife was clearly delusional. There are signs all around. We somehow clasped each other's hands again and walked slowly and silently back home. Our marriage had ended and all that remained was to pick through the remains. Getting upset about it would serve no purpose. I had argued, shouted and screamed, but I would never hit her. I began packing a few items discreetly, preparing to leave. Not clothing, but tools and miscellaneous items. Items that are not required on a daily basis. I assumed it would be me leaving because Ella showed no signs of organizing her belongings. Even if she left, she intended to return. Our house was rented and we both had our own cars, so it would only be a matter of settling the bank accounts, which wouldn't be too difficult. We never discussed it or agreed on a date, but Ella was about to leave for one of her week-long medical seminars, which she regularly organized. We were both aware that the drug company she worked for was filled with attractive young professionals, nearly as many men as women. So there was a good chance that one of her teammates would start things off that week. If not, some damn doctor may be the lucky bastard. I waved Ella off as she drove away the morning she left, knowing I'd be packed and ready by the time she got back. On the following Saturday, I couldn't help but notice the tear in her eye as she waved goodbye to me, and I was only able to hold it together until I returned inside. We both knew, but refused to admit it. It was like a damned train wreck that couldn't be stopped. The train was rushing down the hill, gathering speed. Its brakes failed, and nothing could stop the disaster that was about to unfold. I was in turmoil for the first few days almost convincing myself that I should accept her suggestion. But I knew deep down that I was kidding myself, so it was over. Every day, I wondered who my wife was flirting with and who she was sleeping with. It's not healthy. By Thursday, I hadn't made much progress with my packing, despite promising myself that I would begin seriously that evening when I got home from work. I reprimanded myself for not doing anything to find another place to stay. I was so miserable when I parked my car that evening that I almost missed Elvis's car in front of our house. What the heck was that doing there? I hadn't even reached the front door when it flew open, and Ella burst out, rushing to greet me and calling my name as she threw her arms around me. I met this man, she said excitedly. Clearly, this was not the news I wanted to hear. He was wonderful. She ignored my protests and continued enthusiastically. I met him the first night. David. He's a doctor and older than us, about 50 or so. I had dinner with him and he resolved all of our issues. Honey, sorry, Ella, I retorted, 
pushing her away and trying to control my rage. I warned you, this is not going to work. Of course it'll work. David, can you see? All I see is that my wife has left, slept with a stranger, and now thinks everything will be fine. Life is not so simple. What exactly are you talking about? Ella inquired, calming down and looking up at me with puzzlement. You and other men? I snapped. Are you cheating on our marriage? Oh, that. Yes, damn it, that. But that happened before, honey, she said with a pleading expression in her eyes, and this time it was my turn to look perplexed. So who was the guy you slept with? Which guy? No, I did not do that. Bloody hell. This was becoming confusing. This man, this bloody amazing doctor, that is exactly who I'm referring to. He was excellent, wonderful. I spent every evening talking with him. Talking? That sounded odd. Indeed, he was a psychologist. We are happily married and have three lovely children. So I inquired. Still don't get it. What does his kid have to do with anything? But haven't you seen my wonderful husband? She inquired, and of course I did not. It's my age and hormones. My body was trying to communicate with me, but I misunderstood. What bloody message. I want to have a baby. Honey, I don't need any other man. I need a baby. But I thought you said. I remember what I said when we talked about it before. Ella interrupted, overjoyed. But forget about my career, David. I want to have a baby. I want your baby. So all that garbage. She interrupted again, crying uncontrollably and clinging to me like a drowning woman. Jacob, my doctor friend, explained everything. Apparently, he has written a thesis on the subject and is an expert. Stop dating other men. Who needs them? I want to have a baby. Honey, I want to become pregnant. I returned early once I knew. Please help me. Well, I can't say I took everything in at once, or that I didn't have some doubts for a while. Ella handed me a brief note from her doctor friend written on some very impressive-looking paper. It explained in plain English so that even I could understand that women go through changes at different stages in their lives. One critical time is when they are nearing the end of their lives but still able to bear children. This appears to be equally common among women who already have children and those who have never had any. The former usually get it. The latter frequently become upset and confused. The good doctor, rightly or wrongly, attributed many marriage breakdowns to this issue, and he was delighted to sit down and discuss everything with Ella. I won't say I fully understood everything she told him about her feelings, but I was halfway there when Ella called Dr. Jacob the second night she was back and asked me to speak with him. I found him quite persuasive. What finally pushed me over the edge was a trivial matter. He joked about how much it would have cost us to visit his office for a consultation, but the fact that he had saved Ella's marriage was enough reward. I couldn't really disagree with that, and frankly, even if I could, I didn't want to. If there was a real chance this could work, I was willing to give it a serious shot. How about your job, Ella? I asked. I'm still trying to process my new reality. What is the job? She grinned. I have already given my notice. I thought six months would be about right. It will allow them to choose someone for me to train, as well as enough time for us to complete the task. Better get started now. I chuckled as I took her hand and led her to her bedroom. She wasn't far away. Six months later, we were four months pregnant, which wasn't too bad given that she had to wait for the birth control pill to wear off. In fact, she went part-time for another three months primarily to show off her baby bump to her co-workers. Some women have difficult pregnancies, others have easy ones. Ella was radiant. Her skin, complexion, and hair glowed with health. She smiled and laughed so much that I struggled to keep up with her. Given how overjoyed we were, our friend Lily inquired of Ella, what prompted the outburst at the party? Ella told her about how frustrated we were because we had been trying for a baby without success. But now, clearly everything was fine and dandy. We never heard about it again. And what was that guy's name? Carol's cousin moved back to Dubai, and we never saw him again, just as well, because he was much bigger than me and had apparently served in the parachute regiment. Little Jonathan, named after Ali's father, was born. Perfect. The two delighted grandmothers, who couldn't contain their excitement, pushed my nose slightly out of joint. Not that they ever did, but things did return to some degree of normalcy. We were just starting to enjoy it when Ella became pregnant again. Lily made a comment about waiting for a bus, and four of them arrived at once. We laughed, glancing at each other, wondering what she'd think if she only knew Glenda, named after my mother, who arrived on time and was as beautiful as her older brother. There's not much else to tell you. Oh, yes.
Ella embraced motherhood effortlessly, and our problems, particularly hers, never reappeared. Was the doctor's diagnosis correct, or did a more appealing solution replace a less desirable one? Or perhaps this was the doctor's intention all along? I have no idea, and it is all beyond my comprehension. All I know is that it worked, and we are very pleased. She still wears short skirts and has the best legs of any parent at the nursery, as evidenced by the envious looks of the other fathers. We continue to attend parties and social events, albeit less frequently now due to the dreaded babysitter constraint. And yes, Alice is still asked to dance frequently. Some of her partners try to push their luck, but she knows her limits and strictly adheres to them. They are well within my acceptable boundaries. Ella's company kept her job open, but she never returned, despite the fact that the kids were about to start school. She made an important decision. I want to take an open university degree course, she said with a loving smile. You have a degree, Ella. I pointed out that none of them would allow me to work as a marriage counselor, she explained. That sounds good to me. I agreed. And that is exactly what she is doing now. Planning to start part-time once the kids have settled into their new school? I believe she'll excel at it. Has she ever cheated on me? I really don't think so. Not really. I know her better than anyone else. Will she ever cheat on me? I seriously doubt it. I simply cannot imagine it. And what we both experienced reinforces that belief. Do I have any regrets? No, there is no point. Not even the fact that I had to abruptly stop flirting with young Myla. Ella realized the little beauty when she regained consciousness. Here is the next story. I teased him, saying that I could leave him for someone else. He became enraged by it and decided to do this. Ever been in a situation where a little teasing turns into a complete disaster? A situation in which you did something wrong to a specific person and they retaliated by making sure you deeply regretted it? Have you ever been in a situation where someone sets you up and carefully weaves a web of deceit for weeks in order to completely ruin your relationship? Because if you have never been in a situation like that, you should thank your lucky stars. Why am I mentioning this? Because I have been, and I believe it may have ruined my relationship. I think my relationship is over, but I really don't want it to be. My name is Rose, and I have a story that will make you think twice about making fun of someone. I'm posting here to rant, but I'd also appreciate any advice. I am 26 years old, and my boyfriend Nathan is also 26. We met through Tinder. I found out we attended the same college. We clicked immediately and soon found ourselves in a serious relationship. We've been dating for about five years now. I genuinely believed that this was the person I would marry and spend the rest of my life with. Nathan was a wonderful person, kind, caring, and always looking out for me. But one day I made a playful jab at him, calling him weak. Little did I know that innocent remark would set off a chain reaction of retaliation and deception. Now I understand you may be wondering why you mocked him. To be honest, I was being somewhat playful. Nathan had always been known as a bit of a simp. He always went out of his way to make me happy. As a result, a few of our friends began to mock me and call him a simp. He didn't mind and even joined in on the jokes. I suppose I've always taken Nathan's love and devotion for granted. He was a constant source of stability in my life, always there to support me, always prioritizing my needs over his own. Isn't it easy to become comfortable in a relationship? You begin to believe that things will always be the same, that your partner will always be there for you no matter what. The day everything changed began like any other. We were casually chatting and joking about someone or something. I honestly don't remember the details. In the midst of our conversation, I jokingly teased Nathan, saying he should watch his back because I might leave him for someone else. It was intended to be a lighthearted remark, a playful jab amidst our laughter. Nathan laughed and said I'd never leave him, to which I responded playfully that I might. I told him that he was weak and a bit of a simp, so he should probably watch me. It was all a joke, honestly. But Nathan's reaction caught me off guard. Instead of laughing it off, he became silent. I could feel a change in the air, a subtle tension that had not been present before. It was as if my words had touched a nerve and reawakened something within him that he had kept hidden. Looking back, I see how insensitive my comment was. Nathan had always gone above and beyond to make me happy, showing me love in both big and small ways. In that moment, 
Calling him weak and a simp was the equivalent of dismissing everything he had ever done for me. It was a wake-up call, not only for him, but also for me. It made me realize the importance of my words and the effect they could have on our relationship. But little did I know that this innocent banter would set off a chain of events that would fundamentally alter our relationship. Following my playful banter with Nathan, things between us began to feel off. Nathan wasn't as protective as he used to be, which was a significant change because he was always there for me, sometimes to the point of being overbearing. He'd ask about my day, make sure I got home safely from work when he wasn't there, and be generally attentive. But after that conversation, it was as if a switch flipped. He stopped checking in as the frequency of texts and phone calls decreased. It felt as if he had withdrawn, leaving this space between us. I tried to dismiss it as work stress or something temporary, but I knew it was deeper than that. I began to miss the way he used to hold me close in crowds, making sure I felt safe. He seemed to have lost his protective instincts. It left me feeling vulnerable, as if a safety net had been pulled away. I couldn't help but wonder if my teasing had driven him away. If I had contributed to the shift in our relationship dynamics, I noticed that things had changed between us. But I wasn't sure how to close the gap, or if it was even possible anymore. Nathan and I lived together, and despite earning significantly more, he took on the majority of the household chores. He enjoyed cooking, cleaning, and washing the dishes, especially since he knew how much I disliked those tasks. It was a routine we had established, and it worked for us. However, after that playful conversation, I noticed a change in Nathan's behavior throughout the house. He stopped taking the initiative to complete chores that he used to enjoy doing. Cooking became less frequent, cleaning sessions were less thorough, and the sink's dish pile began to grow. I dismissed it at first, assuming he was too busy or preoccupied with work. But as the days passed into weeks, it became clear that something had changed. Nathan appeared less interested in our home life, as if he had withdrawn from the small things that used to make us happy. I attempted to pick up the slack, but it was not the same. I missed the days when Nathan would surprise me with a delicious dinner or clean the apartment just to make me happy. It felt as if a piece of our connection had faded, leaving a gap in our shared responsibilities and, more importantly, our relationship. At first, I must admit that I felt relieved when Nathan became less controlling and didn't obsess over every detail of my whereabouts. It felt liberating to be able to go out with my friends without constantly updating him or worrying about his reactions. I could take spontaneous weekend trips or spend the night with my friends without feeling suffocated by Nathan's messages or calls. It felt like a breath of fresh air to have that space and independence. I could devote more time to myself, pursue my hobbies, and reconnect with friends without feeling guilty or obligated to keep in touch with Nathan. It felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders, and I cherished the newfound freedom in our relationship. However, as time passed, I realized that my newfound freedom came with a cost. Nathan's lack of communication and engagement came across as indifference. I missed the times when he expressed concern or interest in my plans. While I enjoyed the absence of his messages and phone calls at first, it now felt like a void in our relationship. I began to question whether this shift in our dynamic was beneficial to our relationship. While I enjoyed my independence, I also missed the closeness and intimacy that had once defined our relationship. Nathan's behavior continued to change. I began to notice the absence of those small gestures that used to mean a lot to me. He stopped opening the car door for me, which he had always done without fail before. It may seem insignificant, but those acts of chivalry were symbols of his concern and attention. Furthermore, Nathan's financial perspective shifted. He earned significantly more than I did, and he always met our financial needs without complaint. If I needed money for shopping or other expenses, he would gladly provide it without hesitation. It was a comfortable situation that worked well for us. However, after what happened, Nathan's generosity appeared to decrease. He became more frugal with his money, and I found myself having to ask for financial assistance, something I had never done before. It caused a sense of unease and dependency that I was not used to. I felt as if I had lost not only his emotional support, but also the financial stability that his income provided. 
The lack of these small but meaningful gestures and financial support contributed to our growing distance, and as Nathan and I grew apart, I found myself seeking validation and attention elsewhere. It began innocently enough with casual conversations and harmless flirting with people I met at social gatherings or online. These interactions served as a temporary distraction from the emptiness I felt in my relationship with Nathan. Then, as time passed, I realized that I was seeking these interactions more frequently. The attention and compliments I received from others helped to fill a void within me. It was as if I craved the feeling of being desired and appreciated, which seemed to be lacking in my relationship with Nathan. And I know what you're thinking. Why didn't you just talk to Nathan? Well, I tried to tell Nathan how I was feeling. He dismissed my concerns, even gaslighting me into believing I was overthinking or projecting my insecurities into our relationship. He would invalidate my emotions, make me doubt myself, and even question whether I was acting irrationally. This only made matters worse. I felt unheard and misunderstood, which pushed me to seek validation outside of my relationship. As time passed, Nathan and I seemed to grow apart. Despite my efforts to improve our relationship, nothing seemed to work. Nathan had emotionally shut down, and no matter how hard I tried to communicate or reconnect, it felt like I had hit a brick wall. The frustration and loneliness I felt had reached a breaking point. As you might expect, it resulted in a moment of weakness in which my innocent flirting crossed the line into full-fledged cheating. It was a mistake I deeply regretted, and I was aware it was wrong. It only happened once, but the guilt is still heavy on me. What makes matters worse is that I did not admit to Nathan about my infidelity. I was ashamed and concerned about his reaction. I knew it would destroy him, and I couldn't bear to see the anguish in his eyes. So I struck it. The realization of how far apart Nathan and I had drifted struck me like a ton of bricks when I learned about his massive promotion and the house he purchased without telling me. It was a devastating blow, and the way I found out made it even worse. I remember how surprised and embarrassed I was when our mutual friends casually mentioned Nathan's promotion and new house in conversation. I was taken aback not only by the news, but also by Nathan's decision not to share such significant milestones with me, his partner. It stung even more because we had always talked about buying a house together. It was a dream we both shared, and I imagined us taking that step together. The realization that Nathan had made such a major decision without consulting me felt like a betrayal of our shared dreams and goals. So yeah, I decided to confront Nathan, and it was a watershed moment that shattered any remaining illusions I had about our relationship. I realized he was pushing me away and gaslighting me, making me question my own feelings and perceptions. Confronting him was supposed to be a moment of clarity, an opportunity for us to address our concerns and work toward a solution. However, as you can probably guess, things did not go as planned. Nathan's response was both unexpected and hurtful. He accused me of disrespecting and insulting him, and he used that to justify his new behavior. He contended that he had always been the one putting forth the effort, and that he saw no point in continuing a relationship in which his efforts were not recognized. The most painful revelation was Nathan's admission that he was aware of my infidelity. It felt like a dagger to my heart. He became enraged when he realized he had discovered my mistake and was using it against me. And then he stormed away. Now I feel as if I'm at a crossroads. I feel as if I am losing or have already lost the relationship that was once so important to me. Yes, I made a mistake, but it was because I felt neglected and unappreciated. Nathan may have been a simp in some ways, but he was a good sin, and I didn't want him to stop caring or putting effort into our relationship. So here I am, asking Reddit for advice. What shall I do? Is there any way to salvage what remains of our relationship? Is there any way to make Nathan forgive me? All I want is my old Nathan back. Update. Hello, Reddit. It's been a while since my first post, and I've received numerous requests for an update, so here I am. I'd like to respond to some of the comments and direct messages I received following my previous post. First and foremost, I'd like to apologize for the hateful comments and direct messages I've received. They were hurtful, and I am aware that my actions have consequences. Many people claimed I was attempting to narrate the story in a way that portrayed Nathan as the villain, but I'm not attempting to portray Nathan as the villain or absolve myself of responsibility. I know I made a mistake and accept full responsibility for it. 
Many of you suggested couples and individual therapy, and I appreciate your suggestions. It's something I've been thinking about as I recognize the need to work on myself and our relationship. In terms of financial dependence, I agreed that it was not prudent of me to rely solely on Nathan. I work in a low-wage field, and Nathan, who is more financially secure, has taken on additional responsibilities. It became a pattern, and I got used to it. However, I should have been more responsible and self-sufficient financially. Nathan had always been more financially savvy, and he was the man in the relationship. I just left it up to him. Some comments stated that cheating is a deal-breaker, and while I understand that viewpoint, each relationship is unique. Cheating was a mistake on my part, and I deeply regret it. However, I believe in forgiveness and second chances, especially when there is true love and commitment. I believe Nathan will forgive me. We have been together for a very long time. He understands that my cheating was a mistake, and I am confident that he will overcome it. Ultimately, I'm here for advice and guidance. I'd like to know if there is a way to rebuild trust and salvage what remains of our relationship. I understand that Nathan may not forgive me easily, but I am willing to go to any length to make amends and work toward a better future for us both. It's crazy how some people on social media drew conclusions about me based on just a few posts. They call me a narcissist, unfeeling and entitled without knowing who I am or what my story is. They act as if they have it all figured out, saying I'll see things differently after Nathan leaves me. But relationships are far more complicated than that. You cannot judge someone's life based on a few online updates or posts. I texted Nathan, and he said he was on his way home. We'll probably talk, and I'll provide an update. Hey, Reddit, this is me again. I think it's important to keep you informed, so here's the latest. Nathan returned home, and we had a much-needed conversation. I suggested couples therapy as a way to work through our problems, but Nathan was leaning toward breaking up. I had to beg him not to give up on us just yet, and to give therapy a try. We agreed that if therapy didn't work, we'd consider breaking up. Despite the challenges, I still love Nathan and want to save our relationship, so I'm cautiously optimistic. There is also a practical aspect to consider. I rely on him for many things. We found a therapist with great reviews and scheduled our first session. I'll keep you posted on how things go. Update, Reddit, I'm back with another update. Despite the negativity I've received on here, such as DMs and comments, I believe it's important to keep you all informed. Our first therapy session was somewhat rocky. Nathan had been keeping to himself a lot, and despite my attempts to engage him with special nights out or in-depth conversations, he remained distant and reserved. We even had a money-related argument during this time. I asked for some financial assistance, but he declined. During our first session, we discussed a variety of issues and challenges. I mentioned Nathan's reluctance to share money and his emotional distance. I also mentioned how sensitive he was to a playful comment I made. However, the therapist emphasized that Nathan's feelings were valid and that it was acceptable for him to express his emotions in the same way that everyone else. I'll keep you updated on how things go from here. We went through a few more therapy sessions, and it became clear that things were not progressing as we had hoped. Nathan shared his thoughts with me, saying that he had deeply considered our relationship but couldn't find it in himself to forgive me. He opened up about how he felt he had always put in a lot of effort into our relationship, taking on responsibilities and trying to make me happy. He said it was very hurtful for me to mock him as weak and that calling him a simp hit a nerve. Nathan also admitted that he purposefully attempted to gaslight me because he was so hurt during our previous session. Nathan finally came clean. He wanted to break up. He mentioned that he had been working on the house he had purchased and that now that it was complete, he intended to move in. When I heard that news, I panicked. I relied heavily on Nathan, both financially and emotionally. Without his assistance, I would be unable to afford the lease on my own. The rent was simply too expensive. Moving back in with my parents was also not an option, given how crowded their home was already with my siblings and their families. Also, I didn't have any friends who would let me move in. I was now feeling desperate. I pleaded with Nathan to reconsider, to give our relationship another chance through therapy. I knew deep down that losing him would dramatically alter my life, and I wasn't sure how I'd get through everything without his presence and support. There was no denying it. I was broke, and without Nathan, I would undoubtedly fall. 
Despite my pleading and begging, Nathan was adamant about breaking up. He apologized, but explained that he needed to move forward in his life without me. He returned a few days later to pack his belongings. I tried everything to stop him from emotional appeals to physically restraining him, but it only seemed to aggravate him more. What made matters worse was that I had already spent my last paycheck, leaving me in a financial bind until the following month, with desperation setting in. I asked our mutual friends for help. I told them Nathan was leaving me, but I didn't tell them the whole truth about the cheating, knowing they'd probably blame me if they knew. I asked them to speak with Nathan, hoping they could persuade him to reconsider. Instead of mediating, our friends bombarded Nathan with calls and messages, pressuring him to reveal the truth about my infidelity. That must have completely changed their perception of the situation as they turned against me. They chastised me for not being truthful with them, and they found it disgusting that I had deliberately disclosed such sensitive information. The betrayal I felt from Nathan's departure and our friends' reactions was overwhelming. I felt like I was out of options, so I asked our parents for help. I begged my parents to intervene, speak with Nathan, and persuade him to reconsider or at the very least provide me with some financial assistance to cover the rent and bills until I could figure things out. I also contacted Nathan's parents in the hopes that they would understand and help mediate the situation. However, things did not go as expected. I don't know what Nathan told them, but both sets of parents turned against me. Nathan's parents, like mine, appeared to fully support him. They were disappointed in me and shared the belief that I was to blame for the incident. It was disheartening to see them take Nathan's side without offering any support or understanding. After trying everything, I contacted Nathan directly, hoping he'd understand. But he accused me of attempting to harm his reputation and said any sympathy he had was gone. Desperate, I went to Nathan's workplace to talk, but he threatened me with a restraining order. It's crazy that after so many years together, he's serious about ending things. Now I am stuck. Friends and family turned on me. Nathan refuses to help, and I don't know what to do next. It's difficult and uncertain, and I'm really struggling to figure it out. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Update. This is probably my final update. Things have been extremely difficult, and the negative comments and messages have been getting to me. People are calling me crazy, delusional, and saying I'm stuck in my head. Many people express sympathy and pity for Nathan rather than me, and say they would have filed a restraining order if they had an ex like mine. Honestly, I was hoping for some understanding or support, but it's clear that isn't happening. Everyone seems to have abandoned me, and I'm in a terrible situation. Next month's rent is a big question mark. I may not be able to afford it given how expensive things are in my state, as well as the fact that there is a housing crisis, and finding a roommate has been difficult. If I can find someone to share expenses with, I might not have to move out right away. But thus far, no luck. Thank you to everyone who has followed my story and offered advice. It's been a wild ride, and I appreciate your support. Hello, folks. Jeffrey is here. I'm your typical Florida guy with a passion for gardening. As a gardener, I have calluses on my hands, and the Florida sun burned my skin into a tough tan. I've always been a straight talker who values hard work. But enough about me. Let me tell you about my life, which until recently I would have thought was as close to perfect as it could get. I live in a cozy corner of Sarasota with my wife, Sharon, who teaches biology at the local high school and our two wonderful children. It's amusing how life throws you curveballs. You think you've got the game under control, and then everything changes. It began with Sharon. She has always been as dependable as a Swiss watch. However, she has recently missed dinner due to unexpected meetings. Her phone buzzed like a beehive at odd hours of the night. And then there's Mike. Mike? Her science department colleague appears to have taken an interest in our gardens recently. Health. When I'm not around, I'm not the suspicious type. But even I know that when your kids start talking about mommy's friend, who makes her laugh a lot, you don't need to be Sherlock Holmes to notice something's up. The kids, bless their hearts, are as subtle as a hurricane, mentioning in between stories about school and cartoons how Mike was really funny and mommy used to bake him cookies just for him. One or two cookies. I understand, but when your son questions why Mike comes so frequently when Daddy is at work, that certainly fires up the brain, doesn't it? Stay tuned, friends. I have a feeling this rabbit hole goes deeper, and I'm about to take a peek inside. Hello, everyone. Unfortunately, almost everyone who watches these videos is not subscribed. 
It would mean the world to me if you could get out of the full screen video for three seconds and click the subscribe button. It is free and you can unsubscribe at any time. Sorry for bothering and thank you very much if you subscribed. All right, this is Jeffrey again. Buckle up. Because things have gotten really weird. Really fast. Imagine this. I'm on the living room floor. Box controllers in hand. Getting into a gaming session with the kids. It's our thing, you understand, just a father and his children bonding over pixelated adventures. We're laughing, trash-talking, and having a good time. Then, out of nowhere, while we're navigating some fantasy world, my sweet nine-year-old daughter drops a bombshell. Daddy, why does Mike go to Mommy's bedroom while you trim Mrs. Henderson's overgrown hedges? My eleven-year-old son chimes in. Yes, they were playing a game, but it looked strange. I'm telling you, my heart did not just stop. It nosedived right through the floor. At first, I laughed it off. Kids say the darndest things, don't they? But look into their eyes, that innocent, inquisitive stare. Kids do not lie about things like this. They don't even realize they should. So there I am, a grown man who feels like he has been hit in the gut. I'm enraged, perplexed, and experiencing an unfamiliar level of pain. I don't show my children anything but smiles and strength. So with the calmest voice I can muster, I tell them... Let's put a pin in this game for now, champ and sweetheart. Daddy needs to go out for a while. I go to my local cafe because, frankly, I'm one bad thought away from losing it. The cafe boss, a burly guy with a golden heart who has known me since high school, notices my face and motions me over without saying anything. We sit and I spill everything, every last detail, while he listens and makes me the strongest cup of coffee I've ever had. He doesn't say much, just gives me a firm, knowing nod. Jeff, you know what you need to do, right? He says, and I nod, confirming that I am aware. But man, nothing prepares you for this type of storm. Not for a million years. Stay tuned, folks. The story is far from over. First things first. I begin paying more attention to the details. You know, the ones that slip by while life goes on as usual. For example, Sharon is always carrying her phone with her, as if it were a top-secret device. Her computer suddenly became password-protected. Then there are the receipts, small slips of paper that tell stories about dinners for two. When she stated that she was dining with the ladies from school one night while Sharon was at one of her meetings, I decide to keep it cool and call her. Hello, hon. I'm just wondering when you'll be home. I ask casually, and there is a pause before she responds. Telltale. Oh, we are running late. There are a lot of papers to grade, she says, but I hear it. The faint sound of clinking glasses in the background. The rage is present. Yes, but it is wrapped tightly in a cocoon of sorrow. It's a heavy, dragging object that follows me around. Doubts and anger were whispered into my ear. Every time I look at Sharon, I notice lies. When she smiles at me, I sense deception. However, the gaslighting is what really bothers me. When I mention Mike's frequent visits, she laughs and says, I'm imagining things, implying that they're just friends. Or when I discover a man's watch beneath our bed, something I've never seen before and she says it's an early birthday present for me. I was not born yesterday, Sharon, so here I am, collecting these shreds of betrayal, feeling like I'm on one of those crime shows. Except this is not television, and there is no script to follow, just a guy who thought he had everything, only to realize he was about to lose it all. So I waited, waited for Sharon to return home. Her heels were clicking against the tile like a timer, counting down. When she saw the look on my face, that smile vanished. I did not waste any time, did not play any games. I laid everything out. Every receipt, every whispered rumor, every damn time stamp did not add up. And the watch. That shiny symbol of betrayal I discovered beneath our bed. The room seemed to be vibrating with my rage. I stood there. A man betrayed a man whose faith had been broken, like a glass thrown at a wall. Sharon. I spoke, my voice gravelly. Don't even try to deny this. And you know what? She did not. The floodgates opened and everything poured out. The lies turned into confessions. The secrets turned into admissions. Mike this, Mike that. She was crying. But tears did not move me. Not anymore. I told her you were going to tell me where he lived. My voice was steel. My resolve is absolute. I was prepared to tear this guy apart with my bare hands. And she saw it. My eyes were filled with fury.
the set of my jaw. She knew I was not a man to be tested. She revealed the details. The voice trembled. She begged me not to leave, pleased with me that it was over. That was a mistake. However, a mistake was made once too many. It stops being a mistake and becomes a choice. So there I was, telling the truth, burning a hole in my pocket for vengeance, singing like a siren in my ears. This was it. The big moment had arrived and I needed to make a decision. Okay, this is Jeffrey again. You know, when you're about to fight and your heart is pounding so hard you can hear it. That was me waiting for Sharon to come home. My head was spinning from all the information I discovered, and I was ready to spill it all out. She walked in, all smiles, but her smile faded when she saw my face. I did not waste any time. I said, we got to talk, and placed the phone records on the table. I had circled all of the calls to Mike's number in red so she could see them clearly. For a brief moment, it was extremely quiet. Then she looked at me, and I could tell she realized the game was over. Jeffrey, I can explain. She began, but I was not about to sit through another round of lies. Cut the crap, Sharon, I snapped. You know, the kids have been talking. They have seen you and Mike, so just spill it. The next section was like watching a dam break in slow motion. She began crying, saying it was all a big mistake and that she didn't mean to hurt me. I felt like laughing, which was a mistake. No, she did much more than that. I was so mad I couldn't see straight. I thought about Mike, who was laughing behind my back and threatening to ruin my life. Where does he live? I demanded. I wanted to see the fear on his face when he realized Sharon was crying even harder, pleading with me to let it go. But it wasn't going to happen. I persisted until she gave me his address in between sobs and sniffles. So there I was, standing in the midst of our broken lives. Sharon was a mess, but I didn't feel sorry for her. Not after what she'd done. Everything we owned was turned upside down because she couldn't be honest. I knew what I needed to do next. It wasn't just about yelling and screaming. This was about making things right. Perhaps that meant meeting Mike face to face. Hey, read it. Jeff here. After the confrontation with Sharon, I didn't just sit there. I had plans, and I intended to make sure everyone knew who Sharon truly was. First, I placed a few calls, one to her school principal, a friend of mine, to inform him about his biology teacher's morals. Then I spoke with a couple of Sharon's friends and dropped some hints about the rumors going around. The news spread quickly. In our small town, gossip moves as quickly as a gator on the prowl. Sharon's perfect little world quickly crumbled. Her friends, one by one, turned their backs on her and her job. Let's just say she had to take an extended leave because personal issues became too distracting. Then came the custody battle. I felt like a dog with a bone. I wasn't about to let go. I hired the toughest lawyer in town, and we went to work. I presented all of the evidence to the judge in a straightforward manner. I discussed how I wanted to ensure my children had a stable home with a parent. They could rely on. The courtroom sessions were brutal. Sharon attempted to paint a picture of regret for a mother who made one mistake, but I was having none of it. This was about what was best for the kids, and I made certain the judge understood that. It took some time and effort, but I was successful in obtaining custody. I saw everything while watching Sharon as the judge handed down the decision, her shock and desperation. But the kids were my top priority, and I needed to do what was best for them, so there it is. Sharon's life became a train wreck but I saved my children. They're the only good thing to emerge from this mess. And me? I'm simply trying to move on, to create a life in which we can forget all the pain and lies. The fallout was difficult, but we're dealing with it one day at a time. Sharon. Well, she received what she deserved. As harsh as it sounds, if you play with fire, you will get burned. Even after I had resolved everything with Sharon and the kids, there was one thing that bothered me. Mike. I had his address in my pocket and was filled with rage, so I decided it was time for a short visit. I pulled up to Mike's house, a nice little house with a two-car garage and a lawn that could use some help. The moment he opened the door and saw me, his face turned as white as a sheet. We need to talk, I said, pushing past him and into the house. The expression on his face was priceless, a combination of fear and guilt. I didn't come here to chat, though. I came for answers and perhaps a little more. Mike started with apologies and excuses, but I wasn't buying it. Save it. I informed him that you knew she was married. That's when things became heated. 
Mike made the mistake of attempting to shove me out, but I was having none of it. We went at it right there in his opulent living room, with the big screen TV and family photos staring back at us. I'm not proud of it, but Mike witnessed how a betrayed husband throws a punch. During the scuffle, a lamp crashed to the floor, prompting his wife to rush in. She screamed when she saw us tangled up on the floor. I'm on top. Mike looked like he was regretting all of his life decisions. She wasted no time and called the cops while we waited for the boys in blue. I told her everything, the affair and the lies, all of it. Every word seemed to shatter her world. Mike was bleeding from the nose when the cops arrived, and his marriage was in shambles on the floor, just like the broken lamp. The cops took our statements and I laid everything out, the entire sordid story. Mike did not say much. He simply sat there, looking like a man who had lost everything, which he had. His wife was crying and asking him if it was true, but all he could do was nod. I left Mike's house with the police. My hands shook and my heart pounded. I was still angry, but it felt like I had released some of the poison that had been building up inside me. After all of that drama, I focused all of my attention on the two things that were most important, my children and my job. The gardens have never looked better, and I swear those plants can tell when you're caring for them with a clear mind. And the children, they're doing great. We've had our fair share of difficult conversations and tearful nights, but we're getting through it together. As for Sharon, she's been on a bit of a downward slide. Last I heard, she was trying to put her life back together, but it wasn't easy. She's reached out and tried to make amends, but I can't bring myself to listen. Maybe this makes me cold. However, breaking trust in this manner has a positive impact. A few months later, I'm sitting here, and I feel like I can finally breathe again. I've learned a lot about myself, karma, and how life works to keep things in balance. Cutting Sharon out was like removing a piece of my own history. But it was necessary. It was either that or continue living a lie. And that is not how I roll. Here's my two cents if you're in a similar situation. Be strong. Be decisive. Remember to look out for yourself and your own. Because at the end of the day, you're the one who must live with your decisions. So in my opinion, justice has been served. I've developed a new appreciation for quiet moments. After a long day, I enjoy a cold beer while listening to my children laugh in the backyard. The road has been difficult, but I'm still standing. And this is something to be proud of. Thank you for listening to today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, leave a comment below with your thoughts on what happened. Take care.